does God really have your permission to change your life? Does he, does he really have your permission to, to rearrange your life? One of the things that I've learned in my life with God is that sometimes when I was worshiping God and singing the lyrics that were on the screen, I was not telling the truth. But it really sounded good with the music and everything. <laughs> And everyone else was singing. When we see things, same things like, I surrender all. Really? I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about it for a moment. <laughs> See, when Pastor Brandon feels like there's some areas of resistance in our lives, I mean, there, there are things that could be resisting us, and there are things that we could be resisting. He says, come down, let's pray, right? Let's pray, and then stuff happens. Chains are broken, strongholds are broken, attacks cease. But also hearts yield. Um, I, I sent upstairs a text message a few minutes ago and I said, don't worry about the slides. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. But I, there's a there's a vein that we're in, a stream that we're in. And, and for those of you who are new to that, I want to kind of explain some of that a little bit, that when we commit to being led by his spirit, we, we, that there is a relinquishing of the need for everything to make sense and the need for everything to go as we have planned it. Because many times the spirit intervenes, intersects, um, and when that happens, when he indicates he wanting to do something, we go with that. And, and we want to do that not just in worship services, but we want this to be a characteristic of the personal lives we live when we're not in the sanctuary. That when God speaks to us, when he shows us a dream, when he gives us that impulse that we go with that, that's what it means to be led by the Spirit. It puts us in a passive role of being taken somewhere, of being led. We must allow ourselves to be led, which means he goes. And, he, and we can have our daily lives and our routines and things like that, but very frequently God interrupts our routines to do something different and to do something that he wants to see done, not just in the world, but also in our lives. But my question, don't think I forgot, does God have your permission to rearrange your life? Uh, you know, we can admire young Mary, the mother of Jesus, and say, man, how much did, did God have to respect Mary? out of all the people in the world, of all the women to say, Mary, you're the one that's going to bear my son, Jesus. How much, what kind of character did Mary have? I mean, how do you, how do you qualify for that? When God looks at the resumes of women on the world, he goes, ah, this one right here. 
So we think, man, that's a lot of honor he has for her. The angel said it. You're highly favored, Mary. But do you know that rearranged her life? To be pregnant without a husband? Scandal. The guy she was engaged to was like, what, uh, what happened, Mary? I swear, God did it. Okay, um, we don't need Maury to tell me I'm not the father of this one. Like, I don't, this is, come on, Mary. God did it. God did it. And it was so far-fetched, such a rearrangement that God had to give Joseph a dream and say, Joseph, she's not lying. God did it. Take her to be your wife. I know what the routine and tradition is that if this happens, you put her away. Not so. I'm rearranging her life and your life. So listen carefully. So when, when is, is, is that Grace? Bless her heart. Amen. She, <laughs> my wife and my almost two-year-old there. Um, and you know, you know, you know yours, right? You know yours. <laughs> yes, yes. Just even prophetically, the father knows the voice of his children. That's, that's what the message is for you. He knows the voice of his children. <laughs> And so when Mary heard this, she said, be it unto me as you have said. In this moment, her whole life is rearranged. She says, be it unto me. There's a submission to the will of God and the plan of God. And you see this song that Mary has written. We call it the Magnificat. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. What you see there is an expression, here's the key for our, our whole time together, is the expression of the heart's acceptance of God's will, the heart's trust in God's plan. You have my permission to rearrange my life. And I think one of the things that God was looking for as he was choosing among women to place his son is who is the one who will not resist the craziness I'm about to unleash in her life? Who's the one that will not mind being talked about by the entire village just because she knows she's in God's plan? Who is the one who will not blame me for the criticism she receives? Who is the one who will not get angry when she's having to sit at the lunch counter by herself because no one else wants to be with somebody who clearly has been fornicating? Misunderstood. Who's the one who won't resist? All the side effects of trusting me. See, this whole issue of trusting God, it's where we really, it's determined if we're going to take ground or not. We were talking for several weeks about, about taking ground and the price of the promise. And, and, and the reality is that as we advance in our lives, as we're taking ground for the kingdom or even taking ground for your family, even for yourself, there is no taking ground without trusting God, without obeying what he says to do. And so the enemy will try to steal from you the things God has planned and when he does it, he's going to attack your heart in the area of trust. A person who trusts God with everything, the enemy has no defenses for. The enemy has no defense for a person who trusts God absolutely. Because a person who trusts God absolutely will see the power of God absolutely. And there's no defense for that. All of hell has no defense for the believer who trusts God with everything. 
So then, the trust is an area where he's going to come in. The trust is an area that the father wants. The trust is an area that the enemy wants. Where do we trust? Do we trust in our head? No. We trust in our hearts. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. That's it. For you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. heart. It's first. I'm saying all of that to say this. Trusting God does not happen because you sang a song about it. Trusting God does not happen because you've memorized scripture. Trusting God does not happen just because you're in a small group. You can do all of those things, but if your heart is not open, the trust will not happen. The trust is a decision that you make. It's a decision, an intentional decision. It's a way that you choose to live your life. Trust. Trust. And the challenge that we face in our lives when we, we want to be a part of the move of God. We want God to do miracles, signs, and wonders through our lives. Like, that doesn't happen unless you trust. Right? He gives you a little prophetic words, not the whole thing. It's just a little hint. Why the hint? Because you got to trust for the rest. Why the little piece? Because you got to trust for the rest. You got to trust. It might not make sense to you, but you got to trust. Just speak it out loud. Say it out loud. Lay hands. Pray. Whatever. It's just a little bit, and, you, and you, it, it requires trust. And man, I know I've heard a lot of sermons on trusting God that didn't do it. Sing a lot of songs about trusting God that didn't do it. I had experiences in my life that did it. I heard stories from other people that did it. I read scriptures about it that did it. But the thing is, when your heart is open to trust, you make the decision to trust. Then all of those things actually build your trust in God and your faith in God and your belief in what he says. But here's the reality, you guys. And here's why all those other things, you can do them and it still not increase your trust. It's because some of us have been hurt. We haven't let it go. Been disappointed in God. We haven't let it go. He didn't do what we wanted him to do. We prayed and they're still sick. We prayed and they still died. We prayed and they still got divorced. We prayed and we still got fired. All these things add up. And the accuser of the brethren is also the accuser of God. And so he will accuse God to you saying, God is the reason why this happened. Like you, you really should be mad at him. Think of all those promises and it didn't come through for you, did it? No, it didn't. You believed it still didn't happen. And so now the enemy begins to build up a case in your life against God. And you don't want to believe it. No one comes in here. We don't just come here saying, I am angry at God, but I'm going to try to lift my hands anyway. No, sometimes this stuff, we push it because we're trying to be faithful. We know it doesn't seem to be right to be mad at God or, or to blame God. We push it, we push it, we push it, but it's still there. And when we want to trust God for something amazing, it creeps up and goes, why pray for healing this time? You, re you remember what happened last time. I pray for a miracle. You remember what happened? You remember? Remember how painful it was? Remember how many hours you put in? Remember all, all the in and out burgers you skipped because you wanted breakthrough here? <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it didn't happen. He's going to try to build up a case. And if you're not careful, you'll side with him and you'll be building, watch this, you'll be building up a case against faith in God. Building up a case against trust in God. And if you are blaming God for something that did happen or didn't happen, 
You cannot trust him. You cannot trust God and blame God at the same time. You cannot worship God and blame God at the same time. Because both are matters of the heart. And you just can't be divided like that. And so some of you here today, you're still disappointed in God about something. And you can hear sermons about trust and sing songs about trust and, and oh God, I yield it all. I yield. No, you don't. No, you don't. You're not going to talk your way into it. Trust in God is not hard work. It's heart work. It's heart work. And the matters of the heart, they don't just go away because you don't want to deal with it. They don't just go away because you want to suppress and go and act like it's not there and then, you know, and just go skip it along like you're a happy Christian. No, you got to deal with it. You got to deal with it. That's where the thing changes, really. Because trusting God is real. Like, you can't even fake trusting God. It's real. So if, if you, you could be a person who is a new believer and the whole idea of trusting God is, is new for you. You could be a person who uh, is a, a disappointed believer, an angry at God believer, a blaming God believer. And here's the deal. God's big enough to handle it. He ain't mad at you. He ain't disappointing you because you're disappointing him. Right? You're, you're not his first rodeo. He's been doing humans for quite a bit. You are not surprising him. You're not surprised again. And he has so much grace and mercy and safety for you to be honest with him. I'm telling you right now, there are things God has promised to you. It is yours. No one else is on the planet. It is yours, but it will not be released until you get over that little issue. It's just kind of the way that the kingdom is set up. It's the way the spirit world is set up. Like some things don't get released until faith and prayer and trust in God releases it. It, it. It's not a matter of his will. His will is for you to have it. That's why he planned it for you. But the release of it into your life is really on you. I remember when I, I used to see miracles all the time. I mean, I was I blessed the days. Uh, when I first got into the supernatural, it was in Korea, 2005, 2006. My assignment, I was in the Air Force, a chaplain in, in Korea, and, and some stuff had happened in Korea. I saw my first demon manifest in Korea, saw my first healing in Korea. A lot of stuff was happening. And interestingly enough, interestingly enough, uh, on, on Facebook, I was connected with a friend who lives in Sacramento from that season of Korea in Korea, and she is here today. She did expect me to give her a shout out, but she is here today. Nicole just waved. Yeah, my first time seeing her since 2006. And so I posted, I'm preaching in Roseville, and she was like, I'm in Sacramento. I'm like, ah, you know. And so, so, so even if she was witness to some of the stuff that was like, whoo, I saw all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. But God, my mom's not healed, though. I've seen cancer leave, fibromyalgia leave, asthma leave, bones straighten out, pigeon toes straighten out. I mean, uh, uh, bow legs become straight, and I've seen arthritis of all the kind. But my mom, though, but my mom, so God, I think I'm, if you're not going to do it here, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I began to phase back from all the supernatural stuff. I began to fade back. And it wasn't, I didn't sit down and just make a conscious decision. It was subtle. It just, it was an idea, it was a thought. I went from, oh no, we're just going to press in for this breakthrough, breakthrough. We're just going to press in, that's all we're going to press in. We're going to pray, we're going to fast, and it didn't, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And uh, this, this past December, this past December, my mom passed away unexpectedly out in South Carolina. Man, that rocked me. That rocked me. And, and the thing about it is, she still had her illnesses and sicknesses and all those kind of things. And I was like, but God, why? I mean, I've seen it over and over. Why not? Why not? And guess what? I still don't have an answer. But I know that my mom was a woman of God. I know that my mom is with the Lord right now. And I know that my mom, every day, even with her chronic pain and things, she was fighting every single day 
to have a smile on her face and ask, how are you doing? And in the midst of those unanswered questions I have, Holy Spirit revealed to me and said, John, my plan for your life is still the same. Anointing is still there. Gifting is still there. And it's not a matter of you advancing the kingdom, my purpose for your life. This is a matter of you becoming like Christ. See, don't get so caught up in what God wants you to do. His primary responsibility, primary role in life is not trying to use you. He's trying to make you. So, so the issue of trust for me was not about, okay, I got to get back into trust so that I can, I can flow on the miracles again and I can flow on it. He said, no, no. The issue of trust for me is that Jesus trusted God with everything, even the cross. And I cannot mature as a follower of Jesus. I cannot mature as a child of God if I don't trust him the way Jesus trusted him. So the healing in my heart, even with the unanswered questions about prayers that seem to not go answered, about breakthroughs that seem to not happen, that's the only one. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot. Right? Just like you, there, there's some things you don't, you don't know why it didn't happen the way it happened. Or you don't know why it did happen the way it happened. And it has clouded your trust in God where you don't really believe him for stuff anymore. And if you're honest, if you're honest, there's things you don't really believe him for anymore. But he is the same God. He's the same God. And sometimes the, 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 uh, the essence of our trust in God is kind of like what Job said in his, in his book. He says, he says, though all these things are going wrong, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. There's a lot I don't know. There's a lot of things that are mysterious, but I can't let those things change my life with God for the negative. I've got to let those, I've got to learn how to live with the mystery. And trust God with what I know to be certain about him. I know he's good. There are questions I don't have answers to. But there are other questions, more fundamental ones, that I do have answers to. Is God good? Yes. Is he faithful? Yes. What will happen over here? I don't know. But the foundation now for those questions is, I don't know, but he's still faithful. I don't know, but he's still good. I don't know, but he still works miracles. I don't know, but he still makes a way out of no way. Our trust is a matter of heart work. As a hospital chaplain, I sat by the bed of many, many people, many, many families who watched a loved one pass away. A lot of questions pop up in those situations. And I get used to the idea. Look, it's not my responsibility to, to speak for God on all these questions. I, don't, I can only share if he's revealed. If he hasn't revealed, I can't guess. A lot of I don't know. But I do know he's good. I don't know. But I do know we can trust him. And if you are a person who is disappointed with God, own it. Acknowledge it. Confess it. Don't think you got to try to be this, put on this, this, this air of being a faithful Christian. No, no. Every faithful Christian has had their moments. I mean, the strong faith comes through the valley of doubt and skepticism. And why, God, why? And we come out on the other end strengthened with faith. That is able to face unanswered questions and still believe God and still trust God and still pray for breakthrough. And so, if you're a disappointed Christian, angry at God, blaming God, confess it to him. Say, God, I honestly, I'm still mad about what happened with grandma. I'm still mad about what happened with my child, with my marriage. I'm still mad. I'm still disappointed. You ask him. And you sit still and quiet and let him speak to you. Let him put his thoughts into your mind and pictures into your mind. And he will bring healing. Watch this. That healing might not involve the answer you want. 
it still might be mysterious, but your heart will be whole. Your heart will be healed and you'll be able to trust him again. If, if you are new to this whole faith walk thing, I don't even know where to start. I would say start reading Bible stories. But when you read Bible stories, sometimes it can seem that they're too far away. It's like a history book to you. It's not real enough for you. What I would say then is you got to learn how to discover the trustworthy nature of God. So, yes, read Bible story, but also ask other believers. Ask mature believers. Say, hey, why do you trust God the way that you do? We can hear, in addition to Bible stories, personal stories, somebody that you know, somebody who can just really break some things down and transfer some things to you. Like, but you've got to make it your business to learn about the trustworthy nature of God. Because this is a faith walk, believe walk, trust walk, you're, the essence of your life with God is about how you believe what he says. How you are led by what he says. And the way that you build up your faith muscle, that's not on accident, it's intentionally building it, reading scriptures and Bible stories, listening to the other stories of the saints around you and in community with you. Talking about your questions. So if you're new, those are good, just some tips to start. If you're disappointed, angry, let me add, add this one. I shared some tips, but let me add this one. You might have said, I'm not going to trust God anymore. I'm not going to believe God anymore. So much for this faith thing. That's called a vow that you made, and you need to renounce that vow. You'll need to renounce that vow and break that vow. Say, Jesus, I might, I might have been hurt. I might not have known what was going on. And I know I said that. And if you don't know what you said, ask him. He'll tell you. So I, I renounced that I said this in the name of Jesus. Break it. I choose to live by faith. I choose to be led by your spirit. Maybe you're not a new believer. Maybe you're not a disappointed one. Maybe you're more, more seasoned, more mature. You've gone through those valleys. You know what it's like. Then you, you need to help other people. You need to share your faith stories. You need to share your God stories. You need to share your breakthrough stories. And one, by saying it out loud and saying it over to other people, it'll strengthen it for you. But you need to help. One, of the, one of the most powerful things you can do in, in helping other people grow is helping them learn to trust God. And by sharing your stories, it helps them learn to trust God. And there's something about stories that hits our hearts a little more than just a whole bunch of rationale and logical stuff. You don't, you don't need to build up an argument to try to convince. You can't convince somebody to trust God. Hear me. You can't. That's, that's, that's the head. That's the mind. That's rational argument. You can't. Then, and trust doesn't happen here. You can't, that's why you can't sit down with atheists. And at the end of a, how many of you have seen a, a debate with a Christian and an atheist? And at the end, the atheist goes, I trust God. <laughs> doesn't work that way, right? You, you had a whole long one, one hour, two hour uh, of all this rhetoric. And it doesn't lead to trusting and in, in, in faith in God. Because our heart is not open. Stories impact our hearts. Dreams and visions impact our hearts. One of the reasons why the dreams and visions do that is because that's a way of God bypassing our mind. Where he doesn't just tell us an instruction, he doesn't just tell us something. He, 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 he gives us a clue and leads us like this, this scavenger hunt where one clue leads to the next. And the reason why it's so important is because discovering truth changes our hearts. Reading about truth informs our minds. And because trust is a heart issue, when you discover it, it impacts you and it changes you. And that's why he, he speaks in parables, he shares stories, he gives Im images and pictures and speaks in symbolism so that you will discover the truth because if he just tells you you're going to sit and argue because you think you know everything but when you discover it it hits your heart and you go whoa that's what God is saying yeah now we're going to do about it so share your stories if you're the mature believer share them repeat them he said that over and over in the Old Testament just keep on saying it keep on saying it keep on telling people keep on telling people keep on sharing your story Keep on sharing your story. It's so important. If you really want to take ground, you, you better learn to trust God. You better learn to trust God through the storm and through the rain. Learn to trust God in mountaintops or valleys. Learn to trust God even when questions aren't answered. Learn to trust the nature of God.
And so for me, I've moved through, even before my mom passed, whether she was healed or not, that God is a healer. And that whether disease left my mother's body or not, there was going to be two outcomes with my mom. That either she was going to be healed before she died or healed after she died, but she's going to be healed. For the believer, healing is always the option. It's always the outcome. Healing. Yesterday was my mom's birthday. The first one without her. And trust me, had my moments. And if you know, you know. But even in those moments, it would just glorify God for a life well lived. And for what she imparted unto me and my brother. Both of us are full time pastors. There's a lot that God sees that we don't see. We just have to trust him with it, even if things don't come out the way we want. I believe with all my heart, <laughs> pun intended, that what God has spoken about the rock is going to happen. Move of God, water, rivers, waves, it's going to happen. And you can, can choose to be a part of it or not. It's going to happen. And what will determine that is where you trust him. Parts of that wave can happen in this building. But much of that wave will happen in your homes and on your jobs. And that little thing, that impulse God gives you, and you've learned to trust him, that's where it will be released in your neighborhoods. I want to raise your awareness of that. Because we come together with all of us here, we think this is where it's all going to happen. And this is not where it's all going to happen. It'll happen where you live, where you work, where you hang out, at the gym, the library, the, the basketball court, wherever. It'll happen there when you follow those impulses. And you trust him with those seemingly small decisions as well as those big decisions. See, God's calling somebody right now. <laughs> Call on somebody right now. Let's all stand. Trust is a big deal with God, and your heart is a big deal with God. So don't think like it's not a problem if you have a trust issue. It is, because it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And more than just trusting God for breakthroughs, for signs and wonders, if you really want to be like Jesus, you got to trust him. And sometimes trusting the Father means going to the cross. And sometimes trusting the Father is, is praying for those who put you there while you're still dying. And sometimes trusting the Father it's saying, into your hands I give you my spirit. In the midst of this happening to me as an innocent man, brutalized, suffering, suffocating as blood fills my lungs, Father, I still trust you. Even when I give you my spirit on today, I still trust you that in three days you're going to put my spirit back in me and we're going to keep this party going. Resurrection follows Calvary and some of you right now your trust has not been able to handle the crucifixion but if you can forgive from the cross whoever did what they did Whatever doesn't make sense, even if you need to forgive God, if you can do it, 
He will resurrect your faith with a whole new faith. He'll resurrect your trust. He'll actually make you a whole new person just by changing your heart. If your trust can handle those calories, even on the cross, you've got to know he's with you. Even on the cross, you've got to know he's faithful. Even on the cross, you've got to know that an empty tomb is waiting if you just hang on just a little while longer. If you just still give him your life, if you can still offer him your heart with your hurts, he'll do it. He'll do it. And he'll do it in such a way that you won't even have to doubt his goodness anymore. Like you've been there, done that, and you've come out on the other side with a solid faith and a solid trust. It's not just because he wants to use you. Because he wants to make you. He wants to make you. Everything that happened in your life wasn't God's will. You might have been told that, might have been taught that it wasn't God's will. It wasn't. It wasn't his plans for you are good. It wasn't his will. It wasn't his will. And I feel like as a father, he's saying, he's saying that wasn't me. You, you were told me because it, it made sense to you at the, at the place you were in your maturity, at the place you were in your faith. You were, you were, it would hurt so bad and you were grasping for reasons to, to explain what happened. And, and somebody threw my name in there and said, well, it must have been God's will. And I'm telling you, it wasn't me. You see, you can't come to me if you're hurt, if you're blaming me for the hurt. You won't see me as a shelter and a safe place. It wasn't me. But I'm here to help you. And so I feel like the Father is saying, I'm here to help you. To even change how you relate to me. I'm a good father. And I'll show you. Just come and let me embrace you.